Alright, so most people don't probably think about derm as being something we see in the emergency room, uh, but there are a lot of skin things. Most people kind of have this aversion to ooh, rashes, they scare me. I know what a rash is, got to figure out what exactly it is. You just got to put a sterile. It's all it's, it's dry, make it wet, it's wet, make it dry. That's all you got to know. Alright, we'll talk about that. So, a lot of them are, most, are pretty common. Rashes and bites, we see a lot of these things. Uh, people, I got bit by a spider. Uh, you know, I, I brought the spider in, I think it's a brown recluse, and they bring you this big old like, wolf spider in there. And they're like, it's got to be a brown recluse. I looked it up on the internet. So, no, Google might be wrong, uh, but uh, yeah, it's like, no, that's not a brown recluse. Um, so it uh, reassured them a little bit. So. So we're going to focus on uh, cellulitis and abscesses, okay, these are really common. And, uh, a lot of our, our practices, uh, ABCs, or um, you may have heard that term before, ABC. So advanced practice clinician. Uh, so it's kind of a catch-all between nurse practitioners and PAs. And it's better than mid-level, you know, it's less demeaning, you know. So, uh, so a lot of our practice involves lower acuity patients. Especially when you first start, so we do a lot of these things. We need to be able to separate cellulitis versus erysipelas, so we do paradicky and felon, lax, okay, you can recognize is that really a bad rash or is it uh, uh, something we need to uh, take a look at? Okay. We're not going to go through all the uh, little rashes about. Uh, you know, people, especially the unvaccinated people, that kind of stuff. We just can go through all that. We focus on things. some things that we see more often than not. Okay? So, uh, so there's some interesting ink. Uh, so, uh, this, this is actually a uh, torso. Um, and so, this guy uh, wanted to, went all out and got a picture of Hitler. Um, so, I thought that was a pretty good picture. Pretty lifelike. Um, quite a nice little color. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. They got. A, they've had like a chest tube or something in there. It looks like a stab wound or you know, something there. Yeah. So, anybody think? Guess what that is? We said something. It's Elvis. Yeah. Good job. Yeah. Yeah. Took me a minute too. Yeah. Elvis singing in there. And, uh, hey, guess who's on his other leg? Oh, oh Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of Hitler. So, silent times. All right. So, common rashes. So, uh, a lot of uh, scabies, bed bugs, that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, shingles. Um, you know, I can't stress enough. When you're evaluating a patient, you're on rotations, or you work in urgent care, or wherever you're working, uh, somebody comes with pain somewhere, look at the skin. Okay, uh, you know, get a lot. Somebody see the urgent care for, or they, for their doctor's office, and uh, you know, they've got pain, and their their back's ready around their chest. Uh, they need a workout. Uh, no, they need um, you know a cyclovir because they have. <coughs> So looking at the actual skin, putting them in the gowns, looking at their skin is very interesting. Okay? Um, so we have the benefit of having the hospital setting where you can put somebody in a gown and those kind of things. Doctors' offices and uh, urgent cares aren't really conducive to that, but trying to remember to take a look at those things um, are important. Okay? So um, a lot of dermatitis, okay? Uh, either allergic derm or they've you know, got a source of poison ivy or chemical they work with or something like that. Um, a lot of urticaria and hives, you know, I'm having an allergic reaction. Like, nobody has ever heard of Benadryl. I don't, I don't know why. Uh, so nobody's ever popped a Benadryl to see if they could cure anything or help it. Uh, so we will be glad to do that for you. So, um, we'll give you 50 Benadryl, watch you for five minutes and send you out. So, um, you know, if they're having adrenal breathing or anything like that, obviously it's a little more, more high risk, but I just want to make sure they don't have any risk factors in that. Eczema. Uh, you start, this, this kid's got this rash and blah, blah, Like, Do they get it a lot? Yeah, they get the rash a lot. It's always in the same areas. 
this is an emergency at 2 in the morning, but we treat it. So, when we start to get more serious, so cellulitis, okay, uh, this is an infection of the skin layers. Right. Most common is staph, all right. Uh, staph is one of the prominent bacteria in our bodies. Uh, most people are really afraid of staph. Uh, I, think, I think this is MRSA, Doc. Okay. Probably is. Um, most people will watch Channel 4 and they've scared the dickens out of them without having, having MRSA and uh, some kind of uh, you know, flesh eating bacteria or something like that. So, okay. Uh, most of these things are pretty common. Uh, some risk factors that can make this much worse diabetes, of course. So, bacteria love sugar. Uh, venous insufficiency, especially in the lower extremities. Uh, not doing blood very well, so there's CHF or uh, peripheral vascular disease. And, not going to be able to get those immune things back down there. If they're immune suppressed, they have to have C, they're on Humira, um, or these type of things. Uh, you need to watch them more closely. So it's a local area, so it's warm, it's erythematous, okay? It's tender to the touch, okay? Uh, sometimes it fluctuates. Uh, so it is a little spot erythema, or is it not? Kind of the bigger test is if it's blanchable or not blanchable. Most cellulitis is not really that blanchable. Uh, some kind of irritation due to like a, uh, a mosquito sting or you know, some kind of uh, sting allergy is going to be a little bit more blanchable. Okay, some allergic reaction to it. Okay. It's a little bit, not always. I mean, some people are a little bit uh, different, but that's kind of a general conclusion there. So you get some sy systemic sy uh, symptoms. So you have fever, chills, body aches, okay, and a lot of white blood cell count, okay. So we would probably want to treat first line if we have a smaller area that's fairly well controlled. Um, we treat with some antibiotics, okay. Um, Bactrim, Keflex, some of that, okay. They have an allergy to one of those, and uh, maybe some clindamycin, some doxycycline, okay. Uh, those are your second line ones, or maybe if they uh, failed uh, those, or can't handle them in any way, okay. So uh, other thing I want to do, especially cellulitis, is I want to mark the area. So let's objectively monitor if it's getting better or slow, right? So let's not rely on the patient saying it's getting bigger or smaller. Let's draw a line around it, okay? Uh, they have, you know, skin markers you can use. It usually comes with the measuring tapes. You can actually measure how long it is, that kind of stuff. So um, most people, when they start working here, they kind of struggle with trying to figure out how big things are. Get something to measure. Measure things. You know, after a while, I start to tell, oh, that's about five, six centimeters, you know. Uh, I'm doing that. Uh, other way you can do it, you can have the patient take serial cell phone pictures. I've heard of that before, so um, I think just go online old school. So, yeah. so uh, if they fail outpatient treatment, uh, especially if they have some risk factors um, for, for making these worse, probably need to come in for some IV antibiotics, okay? One dose of IV antibiotics, there's not real great studies to support that, that actually does a whole lot. Uh, so, you know, if I'm going to put somebody in doxycycline, I'm giving you a dose of doxycycline in the emergency room, probably not going to speed it up a whole lot. Um, you know, if there's going to be a delay in them getting their antibiotics, it's evening time, they're going to be able to get their prescription filled until the morning. I give them a dose of their antibiotics before they leave, but if you're doing an IV, uh, you're more likely going to have one, a longer time differential. It takes about, you know, anywhere from 30 to two hours to get antibiotics into somebody, okay? Um, some antibiotics are getting really slow with, like vancomycin, you get really, really slow. You get red man syndrome, okay? Um, you know, so you have to get on so it takes forever, so. Um, but, yeah. I know some people like to give a, a dose of IV or IM antibiotics. You know, some people just makes them feel a little better. Well, not wrong, but it's probably not gonna help the whole time. They need to be a patient and then to the hospital. Usually, pretty soft, and pretty easy mission. You call the doctor. Hey, this person's got this, this, and this going on. Uh, they were on uh, clindamycin already. Uh, they got a little better. Now it's a lot worse. Uh, I'm going to put them in for IV antibiotics, uh, run some blood cultures, and their septic workup's normal. So oh, great, put them in general medicine. Perfect, easy. So, uh, Might a drug rat come in? Yes. Talked about. Some of the name of it, I forget. Backstab. There's a, the one of them was a little bit from 
Orvis stats. Orvis stats. Very expensive. Mm -hmm. One dose. Yeah. Um, well, that'd be great. Yeah. Sure. And they said it was covered by Medicaid. Really? Yes. Wow. So look into that. Have you used? Yeah. So. She's saying everybody sure except for OU in the Metro has it mm -hmm. under ERs. No, I'm sure they do. Just to know what your take or if you've used that. Never use it. So. Okay. Even, I mean, even if Medicaid covers it, I mean, we're all paying for that. So you know, if, they're going to get better with Factor. Yeah, use Factor, right? I mean, it's $4. <laughs> <laughs> Probably cheaper than that for, for Medicaid, right? So. Very much so. All right. So uh, here's some, this is uh, a cellulitis that's basically caused by baby hemolytic uh, strep, okay? The other prominent bacteria in the skin. A lot of our patients come in like, well, how did I get this? What is, what is this? You know, who, who, who did I come in contact with? Or, you know, something like that. Uh, most people get a kind of sharp. This is most likely your own skin bacteria causing your problem, or maybe your partner's skin bacteria. That you're, uh, a lot of times when they, you start to dig down with this a little bit, you know, you realize uh, you get a new boyfriend, a new girlfriend. You know, so you're coming in contact with uh, somebody's new skin for a little bit. Those are our problems. So usually they have some kind of open kind of wound that kind of starts us a little bit. You know, maybe just a bug bite or some uh, meth lesions. Uh, so uh, never seen meth lesions when you do your ER rotation, you definitely will. Uh, so but, uh, basically they get all excoriations, uh, scratching, and that kind of stuff as a little bit. Of so yeah, stuff gets in there and causes some, some problems. So. Uh, the, the problems with this is it can get bad really quickly. And so you don't have to have a whole lot of other risk factors, diabetes, that kind of stuff, to get bad uh, quick. So you can go from a small little area to your whole leg uh, within 24 hours. And so if you, you get somebody that they notice a little area when they went to bed, and by the morning it's almost their entire leg, it's probably a good you know, put them in the hospital and watch this a little bit. So, uh, they, they get kind of this burning sensation where as a Regular cellulitis is more just painful and achy. Um, and so, but you can get some uh, necrotizing fasciitis with this. Okay, you can be real careful with this. Or Stefan, he works pretty well. And again, bark there, I think, so you can kind of go check for the nitrogen. So, this is kind of a different. So, you get this kind of, this is a little bit of a later kind of thing here. So. So this is more of the cellulitis, okay? This one has a little abscess here too. It's not uncommon to have a little abscess and cellulitis. So I touch this here, it's probably not gonna turn real white when I touch that, okay? So uh, this one, it's kind of got the skin that's kind of sloughing a little bit. Um, and that's a little bit later, but um, you can tell it's definitely a little more right. Pretty hard to tell, pretty hard to tell, right? Not real, so you kind of go off the history, uh, how fast it's spread. Abscess. Oh, I love some abscesses. Okay, you know, there's not a whole lot of uh, you know job satisfaction sometimes in the ER. You know, I don't get to see when I put somebody on antibiotics they get better. You know, but an abscess, I get a thing and I drain it and it looks better. The patient feels better most of the time. Uh, you know, same thing with the laceration. You know, you get this open wound and then I closed it. It looks better. Those are some kind of satisfying. That's why I think a lot of people. Uh, like ERs and procedures and ability to do those kinds of things. Okay, so uh, so uh, simple abscess uh, without cellulitis or even just a little bit of cellulitis uh, may not need antibiotics at all. Okay, now that's kind of the book talking. Uh, most of us will put them on some kind of antibiotic prophylaxis um, because of the legality of it and those kinds of things. So we will. Typically cover with a Keflex or a Bactro or something like that after an abscess. Um, they can handle that. Uh, treatment's incision drain. You gotta open it up. So uh, when they come to your urgent care or your uh, doctor's office, um, you need to open these up. Even just poking a hole with a needle is much better than not doing anything at all. Okay? Um, even though it looks like it's kind of open a little bit, you can always open it a little bit more. Just get in there and open it up. Let it drain. Stuff out. Okay. 
Uh, so we've got a risky area, cos this, it might be cosmetic in the face or uh, you know, something that's kind of bigger, uh, perirectal area, something like that. You want to get surgery or something like that involved to, to kind of do that. Uh, ENT doctors will sometimes do uh, the facial ones. Okay. This is a video in clinical medicine from the New England Journal of Medicine. Incision and drainage is the primary therapy for cutaneous abscess management, as antibiotic treatment alone is inadequate for treating many of these loculated collections of infectious material. Most localized skin abscesses without associated cellulitis can be managed with simple incision and drainage and do not require antibiotic treatment. Cutaneous abscesses have been described in all areas of the body, but are most commonly found in the axilla, buttocks, and extremities. This outpatient procedure is appropriate for many office settings, as well as for urgent care and emergency department practice environments. Diagnosis of a skin abscess is the first step in a successful procedure. This can be accomplished in three ways. Physical examination of the affected area will often allow diagnosis of an underlying abscess based on swelling, pain, redness, and fluctuants. Spontaneously draining skin abscesses are also amenable to diagnosis by physical examination alone. Needle aspiration of a suspected skin abscess can assist the clinician in making the diagnosis of a localized abscess when results of physical examination are equivocal. Bedside ultrasound is a valuable adjunctive tool for identification of localized areas of fluid under the skin that may represent isolated areas of infection. An abscess that is diagnosed in one of these three ways may be appropriate for incision and drainage if it is larger than approximately 5 millimeters and found in an accessible location. Extremely large or deep abscesses in areas difficult to anesthetize may be more appropriate to treat in a formal operating room setting. Abscesses of the palms, soles, or nasolabial folds can be associated with complications and may require consultation with an appropriate specialist. Incision and drainage is not indicated for cutaneous cellulitis without an underlying abscess. The need for preoperative antibiotics for conditions such as abnormal or artificial heart valves may require reconsideration of the timing for the procedure. Input from an appropriate specialist may be important for areas of the body with cosmetic concerns because of the expected scar formation after an abscess drainage. Appropriate universal precautions for potential exposure to bodily fluid should always be used. Materials needed for the incision and drainage of an abscess are similar to those needed for a laceration repair. A pre-assembled laceration kit may contain many of the necessary items. For preparation and anesthesia, obtain a skin cleansing agent, sterile gauze, local anesthetic, and a 5 to 10 milliliter syringe with a 25 to 30 gauge needle. 1% lidocaine is an appropriate anesthetic for this procedure. Lidocaine with epinephrine offers advantages such as reduced bleeding and an extended duration of action, but is typically avoided in areas with a single blood supply. Bupivacaine is another option that offers an increased duration of action for the anesthesia. Items important for the incision and drainage itself include a scalpel blade with handle, a small curved hemostat, normal saline with a sterile bowl, and a large syringe with a splash guard, or a needless 18-gauge angiocatheter for irrigation of the wound. Swabs for bacterial culture, wound packing material, scissors, gauze, and tape should all be available to complete the procedure and dress the wound. Obtain informed consent by discussing the risks and benefits of this procedure, including pain, bleeding, and scar formation. Wash your hands with antibacterial soap before beginning the procedure. Protect yourself from exposure to bodily fluids, as many abscesses are under pressure. A face shield and glove should be used. Place all equipment on a bedside table that is easy to reach. Position the patient so that the area for drainage is fully exposed. Apply a skin cleanser, such as chlorhexidine or povidone iodine, in a circular motion starting with the peak of the abscess. Cover a wide area outside of the wound to prevent contamination of other equipment. <clears throat> Anesthetize the top of the wound. This should be done by inserting a 25 or 30 gauge needle parallel to the skin and injecting into the intradermal tissues. Once the entire open bore of the needle is under the skin, gentle pressure should be used to infiltrate with the anesthetic agent. 
you will note blanching of the tissue as the anesthetic spreads out. Continue with infiltration until you have covered an area over the top of the abscess large enough to anesthetize the area of incision. Some abscesses may require additional injections of anesthetic in a local field block pattern or moderate procedural sedation for additional patient comfort. Hold the scalpel between your thumb and forefinger. Make an incision directly over the center of the abscess that is oriented along the long axis of the fluid collection. Resistance may be felt as the incision is initiated, and steady firm pressure will allow a controlled entry into the subcutaneous tissues. Purulent drainage will begin when the abscess cavity has been entered successfully. Cosmetic results can be optimized if the incision is made parallel to existing skin tension lines. The incision should be extended to create an opening large enough to ensure adequate drainage and prevent recurrent abscess formation it may need to extend the length of the abscess borders. Care must be taken to control the scalpel during the stab incision to prevent puncturing through the back wall of the abscess. The goal is to allow enough access for introduction of a hemostat to break up loculations and place internal packing. Use a swab to obtain a sample from the interior of the cavity for bacterial culture. While most patients will not require antibiotics after an abscess drainage, Culture information is useful if the patient's condition later worsens and antibiotic treatment becomes necessary. After allowing the wound to drain spontaneously, gently express any further contents. Additional injections of local anesthetic may be helpful during this portion of the procedure if there is significant patient discomfort. Use a curved hemostat for further blunt dissection to break loculations and allow the abscess cavity to be completely opened up. Insert the hemostat into the wound until you feel the resistance of normal tissue then open the hemostat to perform blunt dissection of the internal portion of the abscess cavity. Continue this procedure of breaking up loculations in a circular motion until the entire abscess cavity has been explored and any deep tracts that extend into surrounding tissues have been identified. Gentle irrigation of the wound should be performed using sterile normal saline. Appropriate wound incision size will enhance irrigation and prevent excess buildup of pressure within the abscess cavity. The irrigation should continue until the effluent is clear. Using wound packing material, such as quarter-inch or half-inch packing strips, gently pack the abscess by starting in one quadrant and gradually working around the entire cavity. Place sufficient packing to keep the walls of the abscess separated and to allow further drainage of infected debris. Overpacking may cause ischemia of the surrounding tissues or interfere with desired wound drainage and should be avoided. Appropriate packing will allow healing by secondary intention and avoid premature closure of the wound which can lead to reaccumulation of bacteria and recurrent abscesses. For a simple abscess, the now openly draining wound allows the body's host defenses to clear the infection without the need to expose patients to the side effects or risks of antimicrobial therapy. After most incision and drainage procedures are performed in healthy patients, antibiotics are not required. Patients with extensive cellulitis beyond the abscess area or with significant comorbidities may require supplemental antibiotic treatment. Providers are encouraged to use their local bacterial culture susceptibility data to guide any such impaired therapy. Community-acquired methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus has garnered heightened attention because of increasing prevalence in skin infections. It is imperative to know and follow your regional management guidelines for this pathogen. Cover the abscess wound with a sterile, non-adherent dressing. Topical antibiotics have a limited benefit and are not required. As with any wound, be certain that the patient's tetanus immunizations are up to date. All abscesses should have packing removed in a few days, and most patients with wounds that have packing in place should be scheduled for a return visit for follow-up and packing removal two to three days after the procedure. Patients should be given written instructions telling them to return earlier if there are any signs of worsening. On subsequent visits for wound care, packing should be removed to allow assessment of the ongoing healing by secondary intention. Use of fresh packing material may be necessary to continue the healing process if significant wound drainage is still ongoing. A follow-up visit should then be rescheduled for two to three days later. This is common for abscesses that required extensive drainage. In the absence of other complications, the need for repacking is not an indication for antibiotic treatment. The acidic environment of infected tissue leads to difficulties with adequate anesthesia provided by local anesthetic agents. Using appropriate amounts of anesthetic, allowing sufficient time after injection, or supplementing with oral and parenteral agents can increase patient comfort. Finally, 
Additional complications to watch for include the progression to surrounding cellulitis, development of a fever, or other signs of clinical worsening. These may prompt consideration for repeat incision and drainage of an abscess or the need for antibiotic therapy. Most abscesses will respond well to simple incision and drainage and will not require treatment beyond packing changes and local wound care practices. Everybody should be an expert now, right? <laughs> All right. So, uh, that's kind of an abscess everywhere else. So, paradicchia is actually kind of an abscess of the um, nail band area, okay? Uh, and so, uh, basically, you know, trauma to the area, nail biters, uh, you know, get some kind of pedicure. Or, no, pedicure's the uh, Manicure. Thank you, guys. Uh, so, see, I've never had one. Uh, Hangnail causes uh, you know, trying to get the cuticles uh, shoved back, that kind of stuff. So, uh, it is thing to introduce some bacteria in this area and, and cause these things. Okay, they're really painful. Um, you know, if left un, undone, there uh, they can cause some significant cellulitis, lymphadenitis, uh, uh, cause some pretty serious stuff. So you definitely want to get on top of these things. Um, just like uh, with the right abscess, you want to drain it, okay? It's probably more likely to put somebody on antibiotics for this than, you know, a leg or a back or something like that. Um, because most of us, our hands are our livelihood, and so um, it's kind of a nice thing to make sure you cover for. This video confirmed my age. <laughs> <laughs> So we have here an acute paranychia, which is like an abscess, and I probably don't need to put a numbing medicine. I'm putting epi uh, lidocaine only. You'll note how much swollen the finger is than the other fingers, okay? And it doesn't quite matter where you uh, do this. You probably we should be wearing goggles, but anyway, this is going to hurt. I'm sorry. Okay, and then putting the numbing medicine in. And you can see it filling the abscess cavity there. And... Oh, sorry. Okay, the idea was to go tangentially just at the top of the skin to raise the bleb. And oh, uh, here we already just, even with the needle, we punctured it. And it smells, by the way. And now all the fuss comes out. Uh, and wait, 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 wait. Now we collect. 
said plus. Okay, and we're going to have to. I'm going to try to do this. Don't give anyone space. Okay, there it's collected. So we're going to put the patient's name on that after. And now I'm going to show you that you have to milk it. Oh. Oh. Sorry. Oh, still hurts. Usually, usually the pain is relieved once you take away all the pus. This is going to require oral antibiotics and also topical antibiotics and also warm soap. So uh, I think in this case, you know what I'm gonna what I'm gonna do is uh, I'm gonna ask the patient to milk the finger himself because he knows how much he can press without being in pain. And, uh, you know, that's basically the treatment. We can stop. <laughs> All right, so uh, Helen uh, is on the other side. So it's on the palmar surface. So this is kind of in the pulp of the, of the finger here. Okay, this would be hard to kind of diagnose. Uh, you know, people usually have some kind of uh, trauma a little bit there, or something like that. So you think maybe it's broken, or uh, something like that. Uh, sometimes it can have some ceramic kind of cellulitis over or other. So you might think it's a parenchyma first. Okay, um, you always want to kind of wonder: is it more of a? Uh, this can be really confused for like a hepatic whitlow, which is uh, kind of a, a herpes infection of the finger. And so if you look at the lips and they got a bunch of cold sores on it. I think you might be on something like that, okay? Um, so it's MRSA usually, okay? Um, yeah, these require uh, incision drainage. Uh, this is not one you want to probably do on your first day as a PA, okay? Uh, just take a little bit, um, probably watch a few of these before you do this. Basically, you kind of go in on either side and you actually put the packing through the, the pulp there. They have two strings of packing kind of hanging out. It's kind of interesting, so pretty rare. I don't see a whole lot. Other things you might want to do is uh, tell your patient that you're diagnosing them with a felon. So they don't read their discharge instructions and think that you're calling them a felon. <laughs> no. So. Uh, lacerations. So, uh, there are lots of lacerations. Uh, sometimes it's little, sometimes it's big, um, sometimes they're deep, sometimes they're not. Uh, sometimes they're scratches, and you're like, why did you come here for this? So you want to evaluate the wound, how long is it, you want to get some actual measurements, um, how deep is it, the age of it, um, the amount of bleeding that's going on, is there any foreign bodies in there, um, and then uh, is it causing any dis uh, dis uh, some trouble with the, the blood flow or uh, that, uh, neurological status to the distal extremities, okay? So, you know, laceration caused by a crush injury or anything like that, uh, get an x-ray, suspect a, a radio based on the body, a grinder or anything like that, probably get an x-ray. Uh, those kinds of things can leave little bits in there. Okay. Is there tendon damage? Is there uh, you know, nerve damage, blood flow? You need to get these things. So then the patient can move their, their extremity. Um, sometimes they have an injury way up here and you know, you know, we don't I think we go, oh yeah, they can move the fingers, they can move the fingers, but they can't move the wrist, you know. So moving all those joints, making sure they work, okay? Um, and then documenting that in the chart. It's very, very important. Because they get something later on, you know, maybe they kind of half kind of severed something, and then, you know, they go home and they go, ah, and they stretch it and pop the rest of it. But when they left here, you are, it was intact, okay? Uh, so you can explore the wound itself. I recommend doing that after you've uh, numbed it up, okay? Like you a whole lot of the probing in the laceration is not done. So. so lack repair, typically uh, if it's older than six hours, uh, we're not going to do sutures. Uh, there's an increased risk of infection. Um, even though we're probably going to put them on antibiotics, uh, risk of complications are much greater. Um, we might do like one loose suture if it's a gaping wound or a couple of loose sutures just to kind of uh, keep it a little bit open but kind of close it up a little bit. Or we do steri strips or glue, okay? Um, if you've never seen steri strips before, we'll start these out. I don't know. We'll start with you this time. Okay. 
Um, oh, yeah, we don't want Yeah. Yeah, right <laughs> yeah, there. Okay. So, uh, you want to make sure you have everything ready. Okay, so um, just like in the IEP kit, we usually have laceration kits. So, um, pass these around. These don't have an actual kit, but uh, these are just the kind of the tools that you're normally going to see. I'm just going to take a look at the, at the way the difference between the needle driver and the hemostats look. Okay, have people me when I see students trying to suture with uh, the hemostats. It works. But Uh, so having everything ready, um, you know, make sure that you've got something to kind of clean the surrounding skin. Um, you don't necessarily need to put, you know, uh, betadine and chlorhexidine inside the wound, but you want to make sure the skin around is clean. Also burns and stains if you get some hair. Okay. Um, and you want to discuss anesthesia options, so, you know, if it's a finger or something like that, you can do a, uh, a digital block. Uh, it's a, a lip. You know, a nerve block, or we're going to do local. Um, some people may try and tough it out. So I don't want any of these stuff. Uh, I think that hurts worse, worse than, than the needle. Uh, I have this big old guy. He's probably like six five, six six. Uh, you know, big muscular guy. He's a bounty hunter for. Uh, um, he's not dog bounty hunter. But he's one of those guys. And uh, apparently, uh, was running after somebody and. Got a chain link fence kind of cut open a big cut on his back. About five or six centimeters. And he was with his buddies there. He's like, I don't need a, that wussy numbing stuff. And, oh, yeah, I'll be fine. Okay. All right, it's up to you. I, mean, you know, I had some ready anyway. I got off three stitches and he's like, hey, Doc, can I get a little bit of numbing stuff? <laughs> I always tell the story to people. And I'm like, All right, we can go ahead. <laughs> Different block. We can talk about this a little bit. So we saw the field block on, at, uh, I think for the abscess. So just kind of just inject kind of around uh, the wound a little bit, kind of make it a little more friendly. So some different things we get about uh, is uh, you know, what, how long these things act. A common question is going to be, hey, how long is this going to last? So maybe you know, about four hours. Okay. Mark can last a little bit longer. Um, this way, you can know, use that for blocks sometimes. You have a really painful finger injury or something like that. It's a good one to use. So just kind of mix them up a little bit. Um, adding epinephrine, okay. Uh, you get something that's really bleeding. Um, scalp, face, that's not the lips or something like that. This can be very, very useful for that a little bit. Sometimes you're supposed to get a little kind of weeping kind of bleeder or something like that. Just can't really find. You know, squirting a little bit of some like you know, epinephrine in there, kind of constrict that. <coughs> get it closed up enough for you to get it. So, uh, you don't want to use it on the, the fingers, the ears, the penis, the lips, the nose, the toes. Okay. <coughs> so there's your light tray. It's got hemostats, heel driver, forceps, gauze, uh, kind of holes and stuff. Different types of suture, okay. Uh, a lot of people are confused about different types. Not really a whole lot of, uh, we don't get too fancy in, in RER, so. The most common one is uh, nylon or ethylon, it's kind of the main brand one. Um, and so, it's the most common one. Uh, good tensile strain, works pretty well, okay. Uh, Vicryl or, uh, is the kind of the more dissolvable one. Good for some subcutaneous things. And, uh, <coughs> Okay, so you don't have to close it up. It's kind of deep laceration. You want to uh, close it up, kind of undermining a little bit. You use some of that. Proline, okay. um, it's a little smoother, a little less scarring, so they say. So uh, plus, it's usually a different color. So sometimes you've got uh, somebody with like a mustache or something like that, and you're doing it on the face. And it's just good to kind of have a different color than black. You know, that get a, so like somebody will get suture mist when you go to the other one. Uh, and then uh, chromic gut, um, you know, that's where all the oil and goes on. Uh, there's some different types of vicryl that there's a vicryl graph which you can use for these things as well. It's a little bit easier to use. Uh, chromic gut's a little bit fragile, so if you bend it too far, it can kind of snap. Uh, and so it's a little bit harder to work with. 
to do the laceration I had, so um, she hit with a uh, beer bottle. Uh, so <laughs> a nice little star there. You did a pretty good job. So uh, staples, okay. I love using staples, okay. Kind of fun, uh, especially for the scalp. Uh, these work great. So um, and uh, lucky you guys, you guys can actually practice here. So I made you guys some fake skin, you know, for a little cut on them, all right, just foam tape, so, all right, and so you've got a stapler, you put a few staples in there, if you mess up, you just staple them over and come around here a little bit, so, so the stapler, uh, these are the most common types, they've got these uh, little handle here, you've got like 30 staples in them, uh, 30, 30, uh, 25, okay, uh, and so it's got a little arrow, and so you just put, take your laceration, and you line it up with the arrow, and then you squeeze, and it pops it in. Okay, it's pretty fun. Especially <laughs> so, if you got like a really long laceration on an area that you're not too worried about scarring or something like that. Um, you know, somebody who is at high risk for kind of pulling out sutures or something like that. Um, you know, psychiatric patients, and that staples might be a better idea uh, to kind of do that. They've probably got all kinds of scars on their arms and stuff already. It's not going to be a huge cosmetic uh, issue for them. Uh, they're not going to use this on the face or anything like that. Uh, scalp is great. Uh, but be careful with the scalp because you want to make sure it doesn't go past the hairline. So, if you get somebody's bald, uh, you may not want to do that on, the, on their scalp. It might be a little uh, pressure stuff to crumb down. You know, they want to keep it nice and uh, slick. So. Ask them first, you know, do you mind? It's going to, I have all the time, we will mind. Uh, so, but, uh, yeah, we're going to pass these around and let's have some fun here a little bit. So. Best thing about using the staples versus the suture material for a child's <laughs> the scalp laceration within the hair. It's quick, it still hurts, but it doesn't take very long. Nope. Plus, they can still wash their hair and you don't have to worry about the um, getting wet or keeping it clean with a, a child. And you can't pull on them and irritate them as much as you can. I love to just stick a stapler in my pocket when I go in to see the kid. Like real hard. Oh, we're just looking at it and then you're done. Sneak up the kid. So, a lot of things we use are strips. Uh, those are great for old lives. Kids that uh, maybe are a little too freaked out by it. Um, you know, people who are really needlephobic. Um, you get a, a bite or something like that. It's got a kind of gaping laceration. You don't want to like yeah. to uh, sew those up a whole lot. Loose sutures maybe, but um, you know, using steri strips are great. Um, Reclosing up a a wound that's maybe be hissed a little bit from a surgical wound. Uh, we don't really like to suture them back up again, so using some stereo strips are great for that. Uh, blue, I love using blue. Um, some people get a little bit, you know, we're like, oh, I came in here to here, I waited two hours just for you to put some super glue on. Yep. So, uh, <coughs> is there a time when you would? Choose like stereo strips over, or like sutures over stereo strips or sutures over glue? Or like. Yeah, so, you know, typically if I think that, uh, you know, sutures are going to be, if there's a, it's over a joint, maybe like that, or I think that cosmetically it's not going to heal well, it's going to open back up, I want to use some sutures. It's going to get better you know, closure, uh, and I can make it look a lot better with those things because I can actually get to convert a little bit or convert a little bit. So it actually heals better um, and over a joint if they bend it, you know, if you wash your hands once and they fall off. So uh, using them those is probably a great idea. You know, it's kind of depends on the area. Um, but then again, if the wound's been open for three days, uh, literally they're sticking needles in there and you know, exposing all that other tissue on, you know, going to all this, in this area, probably not a good idea. But, yeah. And glue, I don't usually like to use it on the hands and feet just because Wash our hands. We're supposed to wash our hands a lot. Um, we can take it off too quickly. Um, we'll do it every once in a while. Kind of just instruct people on uh, how to how to manage that a little bit. Stereo so, strips are usually for like skin tears, mm -hmm. um, things that you don't really have viable good tissue to hold the, the, the suture material. So 
you know, old, old lady skin is uh, uh, very, very hard. You can sew a tomato skin together, and you can sew an old lady skin together. Uh, poor old guys. Um, you know, very, very fragile. Um, you get it in there, you think you tie it up together, and then it just works right there. So, as I mentioned, the series sure sure lines. All right, so suture sizes, so they have these numbers and stuff. So basically, the uh, smaller the number, the larger gauge it is, okay? Um, so 3-0, uh, typically going to use that on the, on the body and trunk, uh, lower extremities, that kind of stuff, okay? Um, so 4-0 is kind of the most common one. Uh, I see that a lot. Uh, and then, you know, so I said hands, I mean, like, I say working man's hands or anybody that uses their hands a lot, kind of calloused up hands or anything like that. I want a stronger tensile strength than, than that. Um, somebody's got dainty kind of little fingers and probably would use a 5 0 on them, a little smaller. Use that on the face, the genitalia. Um, if you're worried about the face or cosmetically important things, you get somebody that's a hand model or something like that, probably want to use some little tiny sutures. You use lots of little tiny sutures and you'll leave them in less time. So, do 6-0, I've done 7-0 before. That's like little tiny things and it's really hard to, you can't pull it very tight because it rips and tears. So, uh, so sooner removal times are basically six days. Uh, you don't want to do it longer, otherwise you're going to get scarred off and you actually puncture them with the, with the suture. Mark. Over a joint would be 14 days, uh, all others about 7 to 10 days. You tell them when they're going to come out. So I always put it on their discharge instructions when they should come back. Okay. So anybody who's got a hand or foot laceration usually gets a script for antibiotics. Okay. Uh, just high risk for recurrent infection. Uh, plus our hands are like I said, our livelihood for a lot of people. So um, doing those things are important. Usually Keflex or Stack or something like that is pretty easy. Okay. If you suspect any kind of tendon injury, okay, you definitely need to uh, get them follow up or contact a orthopedic doctor and uh, put them in a splint you know, just to prevent that. Uh, I always tell them, you know, especially if it's kind of suspect, I do. I don't really know. I can't see one, but you know, you have some limited range of motion. Sometimes people are just knees with their, their pain and. It's better off just putting them in a splint, you know, a finger splint, a wrist splint, uh, have them follow up with orthopedics. You know, I always tell them, hey, you may get to the orthopedic doctor, take it off. They'll tell you I was an idiot for putting it in there, wasting your time. But, you know, I always like to be better safe than sorry. So if it's over six hours, uh, no sutures or staples. And I am going to do some suture, what we call loose sutures. So we're just kind of bringing this a little bit closer together, we're not full, uh, full on uh, touching each other. And then we always want to make sure they're up. They're up to date on their tetanus, right? I used two depth, so we used a little pertussis booster. Really. Other wounds, so uh, puncture wounds. You want to just clean these things out really good, uh, especially if it's a bite of some sort. Um, you get an x-ray to make sure there's no foreign bodies in there. Uh, sometimes uh, nails will break off. Um, people step on like sewing needles and those kind of things and uh, break it off in there. Those are usually sometimes you gotta get orthopedics involved and uh, sometimes you have to use some fluoroscopy or something like that to try and find it. It's hard to just it's literally like almost like trying to find a needle in a haystack you know, sometimes. Sometimes you can almost feel it, but you can get it, but it's pretty hard to do. Dog bites, okay. Uh, we gotta discuss with them, um, you know, about uh, doing some prophylaxis for rabies. And rabies is pretty rare. Uh, especially in the city, but um, it doesn't mean it doesn't happen, so uh, you need to have a discussion with them. Uh, most times you can uh, get animal control involved and they can uh, go and find the dog or uh, you know, whatever um, and, uh, and get them watched so they can see if they have any signs of, uh, of rabies or anything like that. Um, but you know, the delay of, of rabies is so long that you really can't tell. Uh, there's no easy way to test, so it, when in doubt, you need to treat. Okay? And the treatment involves uh, you know, doing uh, the rabbit <coughs> and the, the immunoglobulin uh, 
in the wound, all around the wound, and then, you know, so say it's in like a finger, you had a bite on the finger, you do as much as you can, and then you do further up the extremity. So they get tons of shots, and then they have to come back for a red vert again, uh, like on the seventh, and the fourth, seventh, and the fourth, and the tenth day or something like that. So they come back three or four times for uh, more wound uh, stuff. So, so it's kind of a commitment. And so the biggest thing we're going to see with it is uh, localized infection through the polyproprial <coughs> uh, mouth uh, bacteria of the dog or cat or whatever it is. And so I'm going to place them on some antibiotics. Okay. Human bite. Uh, and so uh, you would think there'd be a whole lot of human bites, but people like to bite each other when they're fighting. So, uh, or more specifically, uh, people punch somebody in the mouth and they inadvertently get a tooth into that area, uh, so you can uh, do a superficial abrasion, uh, you can uh, get some bacteria injected into the uh, tendon space, and uh, they can get a, a, ten, a flexion tendocinitis with that, and cause pretty severe infection, they can lose function of their hand if they get treated. So uh, sometimes it actually needs uh, a surgical debridement and uh, uh, ortho. Usually these things require, you know, they come in for a hand, they think they just broke their hand and they're going to leave with a splint or a cast and um, you know, that's what they think is going on, but uh, they end up getting admitted for IV antibiotics and uh, get a surgery. So, and a lot of people won't tell you, uh, you know, what actually happened and they think we're going to, you know, call the cops or something like that and so, you know, trying to tell them about these things, you know, hey, I don't care what happened, I just need to know because it changes what we're going to do. Um, you know, is this abrasion just because you, you really just fell onto the pavement, like you said, uh, or did you punch somebody? You know, uh, we're not calling the cops on you or any of that, as long as you don't punch any of us, uh, we're good. Uh, so, you, know, you can punch whoever you want. So, Stevens Johnson, okay, put it on here, I'm not going to spend a whole ton of time on it, I think you guys have Probably had this several times. Um, you know, so uh, it's just on every test. So uh, I'm going to show it to you guys. Get this a little bit. Um, you guys can kind of speed up through this just a little bit because I think you guys probably have this a little bit. It's pretty rare. Um, one of the biggest things is, you know, if you suspect a rash is uh, a little like this, you need to get your doc involved and uh, go through the steps of trying to figure out uh, if this is something that's going on. So, Pictures, it's kind of target lesion disease, vestibular uh, bolus kind of uh, lesions, okay, target lesions. So you see something that looks like that, then like a regular papule, something looks odd. <coughs> so treat this more like a burn almost, so you know, we're getting uh, high doses of steroids and uh, fluids, fluid resuscitation, you actually send them to a burn center usually or a burn unit. The mouth, you want to make sure they can still drink and those things. So, mouth uh, ITP, um, it's fairly rare, uh, but it can happen spontaneously. Um, and so, you want to look out for this. So you get some rash, it kind of looks like almost like a dermatitis or stasis dermatitis or something like that, or you get some you know, bleeding gums or some lesions. Um, I just kind of first notice some this particular kind of rash first. Um, and you're kind of like, what's going on here? Why, why should they have a young, healthy person? Why are they having, um, you know, stasis dermatitis? Or That's kind of weird. And I start looking around, see some bruising in the mouth or something like that from brushing your teeth. You know, they, you know ask them, you know, when you brush your teeth last night, did you, did you have, uh, you know, uh, some bleeding within? Like, yeah, yeah, I did. Uh, so those are some, some things to be looking out for. And then you know, look in there and see some, Gums are bleeding a little bit, easy bruising, kind of noted. So uh, that's time to get some blood work. It's not just a simple rash. Uh, so we get a, a CBC, CB, PTNIR, uh, UA, mainly because we're looking, we want to differentiate this between some of the other um, anemic type of things that are going to have uh, protein in the urine. Okay, so it's mainly going to have extremely low blood platelet count. 1,000 you know, platelets versus 300,000. And treatment is pretty much 
watchful waiting and treatment of steroids, uh, sometimes using the kind of contact a hematologist, usually they only do these people for these things. So you can have you can match platelets and, and have them ready, but most times not needed. Questions?